Hi everyone, thank you for joining our meetup today. Uh, we see some people joining us. Okay, great. So we get started. So before we move along, I just want to give some a few message um, before I pass it on to our speakers today. Uh, the meetup is being recorded and you're going to receive the video if you have signed up for the newsletter. Uh, that will talk a bit more about that. But feel free to ask us questions using the Q&A button. Uh, this helps us like follow up on the questions and uh, make sure that we get some time to answer. I have two amazing speakers today, but I'll leave Davo to speak a bit more about that. Thank you, Natalia. And thank you for organizing as every single time. Uh, everybody welcome. This is our fifth uh, global feature store meetup. This is a group where we talk about feature stores in a vendor, vendor neutral way. Uh, we welcome participation from everybody and we have, thank you for being here and engaging with, uh, this, growing, uh, with this growing community. Uh, today, we'll have two uh, really cool talks. The first talk is uh, about online feature store uh, where Fabio Busso from Logical Clocks will talk about kind of how they do and enable real-time predictions with the online feature store. And then in the second half hour, uh, Arbaz Khan from DoorDash will talk about uh, how to build a cost-efficient online feature store based on Redis. And so, and then we'll end with the uh, Q&A. So I'm super excited to see these uh, two cool talks, especially for real-time predictions. Uh, just a little bit about who we are. So we are, uh, the uh, this feature store meetup is organized by uh, Jim Dowling, the CEO of Logical Clocks and myself. I'm David Bonacci, CEO of Cascara. Uh, we started this uh, a, a quite a few months ago and have, have organized uh, so far five meetups. We also have a feature store.org website with lots of kind of content links to talks, uh, links to different uh, write-ups on feature stores, as well as a Medium page and a newsletter. So I'd like to kind of invite everybody to sign up for the newsletter. This is kind of how we share information about future meetups, what's new and hot uh, in the space across the industry. So kind of please sign up uh, and hopefully we'll share uh, interesting information, continue to share interesting information in the coming months. Uh, and then we want to kind of announce a future meetup on May 4th. We will have a talk from Spotify about feature stores and what they are doing uh, in this space. And then if you are interested in participating and speaking at a feature store meetup uh, in the future, please don't hesitate to, uh, to reach out and we'll, we'll find uh, the time schedule to, uh, to make that happen. Uh, with that intro, we'd love to kind of uh, hand it over to Fabio. Uh, it's kind of, he works at Logical Clocks and leads a feature store team there. And he'll talk about kind of ideas behind the online feature store architecture, how to use it. And I understand he has a cool demo. So Fabio, please take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, let me let me go ahead and, and share my screen. So um, thank you for joining today. Um, so in this talk, we're gonna uh, yeah, discuss about the AppSource feature store, uh, the online feature store, uh, a bunch of ideas behind it, uh, the architecture, and how users can actually interact with it. Um, so I kind of assume that you are really familiar if you ever participated to these uh, uh, meetups before about the idea of the feature store. Um, the idea behind it essentially is uh, kind of aggregating uh, pipelines to pull data, for instance, from backend services um, that you have spread across the organization, do a bunch of transformations, and instead of having different pipelines for different models, um, that becomes extremely, uh, extremely consuming in terms of resources and, 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 uh, and time. Um, the pipelines actually write to the feature store and uh, the feature store becomes then the source for uh, both like training models and also using the same features for serving this model in production and uh, and retrieving these features uh, with uh, extremely low latency. Um, so 
in this this uh, in this uh, presentation, we're going to discuss only in particular about the online feature store and. The main motivation behind it is comes actually from like uh, a classification of the models that that you see uh, in in machine learning. So uh, essentially, when 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 you you can classify models in analytical models and and operational models. Um, analytical models are models where you basically have a bunch of data uh, on the this case in the offline feature store, and you have like periodic process uh, processes that basically go to the offline feature store pull data from the offline feature store, um, do a batch inference, and then generate a report. Um, a case uh, that connects to the demo later on would be something like um, you have a bunch of transactions, you are a payment processing company, you have a bunch of transactions, and every night you go through all those transactions and determine which of those transactions were actually frauds and generate a report to actually uh, yeah, take actions. Um, that might or may not be good enough. Um, like a better approach and a more like valuable approach would be to uh, have like these transactions being scored uh, as they come in. Um, so you can block them or report them immediately. Um, to achieve that though, uh, you, need, uh, you need the online feature store. Um, the idea behind it is essentially where the uh, transaction comes into the system and uh, the transaction needs to be evaluated by a model. Um, the model might have, I don't know, Thousand features, two thousand features, and so on. Uh, that needs to uh, take into account to make a prediction. Uh, but those features do not come from the users; they come from maybe other backend systems and so on and so forth. And so those features are aggregated on the online feature store. So the backend system just like the, the backend system handling the transactions just need to go to the online feature store, fetch the features they need, uh, and and use them to make a prediction to the to the model. Um, Two differences, like the offline feature store uh, latency is not as critical. I mean, if the if the reporting takes an hour, it takes uh, you know, or takes uh, two hours, doesn't really matter. Uh, on the uh, operational models, uh, latency becomes a, a critical. Uh, higher latencies means worse uh, uh, user experience, and availability is also key. Um, and we see later how we take these two fact uh, into uh, into account for the offline feature store. Um, so the way we built Opsox, uh, feature, the, the, online, the online part of the Opsox feature store uh, is based on uh, RomDB. Um, RomDB is uh, a continuation of the uh, NDB cluster. It's a low latency, high available in-memory database um, that like, uh, has a bunch of nice properties. One particular property that suits well the architecture of the online feature store is that while it provides full SQL capabilities, if you do queries uh, on a primary key lookups, it essentially acts as a key value store. So as a low latency, uh, extremely high throughput uh, um, uh, capabilities for querying, uh, for doing a query for uh, primary keys, essentially. And that suits well the online feature store case because oftentimes you end up uh, uh, fetching feature vectors for a specific customer ID or a specific uh, uh, I don't know, transaction ID or something like that. So uh, you always have this key identifier, which then translates into uh, primary keys in, in, the, in the storage that allows you to fetch, uh, uh, yeah, to low latency, the, the, the features you need. Um, we built a bunch of services and APIs in front of it uh, to make it usable and like extremely uh, and, and user friendly for users and the data scientists to use it. Um, so the idea is that if you, if you look at the on, on the left side, um, we have the HSFS library, which is our library. We'll talk a little bit later on top of it. Um, the idea is that users can use whatever, like um, I would say technologies they prefer. It can be Lacanda's data frame, it can be Spark um, data frames, it can even be Spark streaming data frames. They do all the transformation they need uh, to apply, uh, apply those transformations. And instead of writing the output directly into the online feature store, um, they, write, they write into uh, Kafka topics. Um, the main motivation behind it is uh, mostly safety. Um, so especially with like newer users, especially on Opsworks, Opsworks gives a lot of um, flexibility to user to like uh, configure their own Spark application and stuff like that. Uh, we have seen, that especially with like newer user, um, they might spin up a gigantic Spark application, uh, eating the storage really well, and really uh, eating the storage. Uh, and this becomes problematic in terms of availability. Uh, as we said before, um, availability and low latency are the two keys aspect to uh, the online feature store, I would say. 
Um, so having this Kafka uh, topics in the middle allows us to kind of control as a platform, control like the, the writes uh, and how often and how fast we write into the storage and making sure that the, uh, the feature store is always available. Um, the trade-off here is essentially um, we prefer to have a little, a little like stale data rather than having no data at all. So freshness, uh, like availability over over freshness of data. Um, so once the data comes into the, to the Kafka topics, um, we have developed a service uh, called Online Feature Store Kafka J. It's essentially a small Java application that connects into Kafka, pulls the uh, pulls the different topics. Uh, batches the operations and writes this operation into uh, writes the, uh, the, the, the essentially the, the features into the uh, online feature store. It does that by um, by batching the operations. So it takes it takes um, it's quite good in terms of in terms of, in terms of throughput and and and, and latency essentially. Um, Everything gets serialized. We different stages. Uh, we uh, use Avro to send stuff around between different services. Uh, in particular, um, when it comes one of the one of the types of the features that we often see uh, are embeddings. Now, the, 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 the embeddings represent, like I say, it's, it's one example of a type of features called uh, that we define as complex types. Um, essentially, types that are not like integer strings or like doubles and so on. Um, the uh, idea to, to make this thing performant uh, is to actually not like write them directly to storage, but write them as, as binary blobs. Um, so what we do uh, behind the scenes uh, is essentially uh, uh, we, as, as I mentioned, when we send uh, vectors around um, different services, we use uh, we use Avro to encode and decode uh, decode the, the the different vectors. Um, we do one additional step. So when, when you write a feature group, uh, which is essentially uh, um, contains complex types, let's say it contains a feature, which is an embedding. What we first do is we do a first uh, pass of the data uh, where we actually encode all the complex types, or all, for instance, in this case, the embedding feature into our byte array. Um, then we encode the, 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 the second step would be uh, encode this uh, encoded feature group, I would call it. Uh, into the uh, into like larger uh, byte array, which is essentially uh, again using Avro, um, and send it to the Kafka topic to be ingested into the online feature store. Um, the same thing happens on the other side. Um, so what the, the in the RoundDB will actually be uh, deserialized and 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 store as uh, as different types, except for the uh, complex types. The complex type will be stored as embeddings as well. Uh, sorry, uh, as 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 byte arrays as well. So when you read them from the from the other side, when you actually need to use the, the features, um, you, you make a query to the to the to the storage, and the storage will give you back all the like basic features as, as they are. So like all the integers as integers, all the doubles as doubles, and all the complex features as byte arrays. And we do one last pass uh, of specialization so that we are back to uh, to the embeddings, uh, original embeddings. Um, all these passes are like uh, are not mandatory. So if there are no if there are no uh, complex features, they're completely skipped and we write directly we write directly to the storage. Um, all this complexity is actually hidden behind the API, so users don't really see it. Uh, as I mentioned before, like users only interact with the uh, HSFS library. Um, the HSFS library is the library that Opsorx Op provides to uh, interact with the feature store. Both offline, online feature store, and also um, interactive with uh, serving vectors and, and retrieving serving vectors. Um, the feature store, the, the HSFS library is built on top of uh, different uh, frameworks. Uh, you, can, you can use uh, Apache Spark, uh, but you can also use uh, Pandas and NumPy in a pure Python environment. And the library handles, handles both of them uh, and is uh, automatically configured itself depending on the environment that you are in, essentially. Um, so, if you want to use it, um, essentially the first thing you have to do is create uh, an online feature group. Um, an online feature group is a set of features uh, that share the same primary key. They are updated together, and essentially they, they usually contain features that are correlated with each other. They have the same some sort of meaning um, together. Um, the way you define them in Opsource, um, the same way you define them in uh, offline and online, you give it the name of the feature group. You can have different versions. Um, you can define a primary key. As I mentioned before, uh, RonDB is optimized for primary key lookups. Um, so it's extremely important you define one. 
Uh, in our case, we have customer feature groups with a bunch of customer features, and the primary key is going to be the customer ID. So all our queries will be hitting the customer ID, a specific customer ID. Um, we have descriptions. Uh, it's not it's not mandatory. Uh, and then the last step is essentially to say, okay, we want we want to enable the online storage for this feature group. Um, what this does behind the scenes is it taps a bunch of metadata uh, into OpSource, so it taps all the Kafka topics, and set taps also the storage so that it's ready to ingest data uh, from the uh, from the online feature store for the online feature store. Uh, when you actually have to insert into the online feature store, um, you have two options. You have a batch insert mode and you have a stream insert mode. Um, the batch insert mode is the one you see right now. Um, the idea is that you maybe you're doing backfilling of the online feature groups or you are like uh, updating the online feature group, but luck, not in a streaming fashion. So you're getting um, new trash data every, let's say, every night and you want to update the online feature group. So every night you call a job um, that basically uh, calls this insert method. Um, you can, when you call the insert method, you can specify the storage. Um, the idea is that we allow you to choose uh, to write on both storage, so offline or online, or write only to the online feature store, or, or on, your, on the online feature, offline feature store. Depending on what you're doing, you might want to decide to write only to the online feature store, especially if you're writing small chunk of data. You might want to keep the data fresh on the online feature store. Uh, but wait until you have a larger set of data to write to the offline feature store uh, so that you don't end up with like a lot of small files and a lot of like, uh, um, yeah, spread across small data spread across a lot of files that can cause issues and performance issues uh, later on when you're using the train data sets and so on. Um, if instead you have a, uh, if instead you, you have a streaming processing, so you have a, like an example we will have in, in a second. Um, you have a, um, a streaming source like a Kafka topic or any other, uh, let's say, uh, managed streaming uh, applications, um, and you're doing transformation over that stream. Um, this works only on, on, on Spark, on Spark streaming. Um, but the idea is that instead of uh, you basically provide to the API uh, a Spark streaming data frame, and the API take care of uh, setting up the sync, the Kafka sync, for writing to the offline feature store. Uh, sorry, to write into the online feature store. Um, so all these like setting up like where the brokers are, authentication, and uh, a bunch of other metadata um, is done behind the scenes and still kept by the platform and by the API. So that's basically uh, help you out uh, on that. Um, for when it comes to actually um, serving the features, um, the idea behind it is that uh, you don't you don't um, look for specific feature groups. Uh, but when you are training a model, you generate what we call an, a train data set. The idea of a train data set is a materialization of the uh, different uh, of features from different feature groups at a specific point in time. So you can pick different features from different feature groups and materialize them in a single uh, in a single entity, which is a train data set, and use that train data set to train the model. So in OpSource, we uh, kind of detect automatically uh, which feature groups have been used by, by which features. And sorry, which uh, feature groups have been, been used uh, in which train data set and which features have been used in which train data set. Um, and then also we detect the next step, which is basically if you take the train data set and use it to um, create a model, then we can detect, uh, okay, this model has been trained with this specific version of the train data set that was used by this, was, was simulated using this specific version of the feature groups. Um, so what we see here essentially is that when you want to get a certain vector for a specific model, um, you ask the, the, the platform, say, okay, uh, I have this model was generated with this terrain data set. So in this case, AML underscore TD version one, uh, we get back the metadata from, for the terrain data set. And we say, okay, for this terrain data set, I want this serving vector for this specific uh, client ID. Um, client ID is actually like a, a place so that would say for, for a dictionary of keys um, where each key represents a different primary key in the different feature groups. Um, what this does behind the scene essentially is the following. Um, the call gets sent uh, from the uh, API to the first thing it does, it goes to OpSox metadata service. It fetches information about, okay, this model has been turned into this training data set. Um, this training data set is composed with these features coming from these feature groups. 
remembers the order of the features and the, so that it gives it back gives them back in the same order. Um, it remembers like it, it, we, we fetch some metadata about which which of the primary keys are actually um, which primary keys are part of which feature groups. So all the all the feature groups primary keys, and we basically build up a set of queries that we can then push down to the storage. Um, and that's the kind of the second step: take the queries, send them to the uh, to the storage, um, and we do that using uh, using a JTBC connection. And when we actually get back the results, we can concatenate the different results, making sure that the order is still correct, and uh, do the last step of deserialization in case we have uh, complex features, as I was mentioning earlier, and then give you back uh, a Python uh, a Python array. So you can take this Python array and feed it into into your uh, modern inference platform. Uh, so that's um, that's kind of like the conclusion of like the the, the idea behind different the, the feature group, the online feature store uh, in Opsox. Um It's available today. You can try it out, and I can show you how you can can get started. Um, there's a bunch of stuff that we want to work on, and that we're gonna kind of work on next. Uh, one thing we want to do is to publish some um, out performance numbers on the uh, on, on the platform. Uh, so if you are interested, stay tuned on the Logic Clocks blogs um, for for them. Um, right now, we are using uh, JDBC as a, as a way for uh, doing fetching metadata from the um, from the sorry fetching the inference vector from the online feature store. Um, the idea we want to extend this one to allow also for REST and gRPC APIs. So um, for some users, um, that's that's a preferred way to to fetch data uh, from the online feature store. Uh, one additional thing that we, we we are looking into is that the uh, using uh, Apache we use Apache UD for um, uh, for the offline feature store. Um, for those of you who don't know what Apache UD is, it's a basically a library that sits on top of uh, of Parquet that allows a bunch of uh, cool features like uh, upsets, like time travel, and so on. Uh, one thing he has is a data streamer. Um, the idea is that you it plugs in into into Kafka uh, or any streaming source and basically pulls uh, periodically into Kafka and writes the, the result uh, into into these uh, UD files. Um, the idea would be to essentially extend this uh, pipeline that we have on top of it uh, at this stage, uh, where once the data has reached the um, the feature groups. Uh, the uh, online feature store will consume it at its own rate uh, to write into the uh, feature store, the online feature store, and then we will have uh, Kafka, uh, so this data streamer, uh, pulling data from the same Kafka topic and writing into the into the offline feature store. So we're making sure that we have the same data on, on both SA. Um, yeah. So let me go ahead and kind of show you how you can. Uh, get started with it. So the online feature store is, is available um, through Opsox.ai as well. Um, so Opsox.ai is, is, is kind of our platform uh, in the cloud. Um, the idea is that you can um, set up uh, a new cluster for uh, both on Azure and on AWS. Um, you can yeah, set up a bunch of information about the, the cluster itself, which version, the machines type you want, how, how many machines you have, um, and a street bucket to store your uh, offline uh, offline feature data. Uh, and uh, one of the new things we have is this uh, run the BD tab allows you to essentially uh, configure the um, the online feature store. So you can enable it. It's not enabled by default. By default, you get a small um, online feature store just to try it out, uh, which is like great for trying out uh, different things. But like if you want to kind of take it uh, to a next level, then the idea is that you create a separate cluster of machines dedicated to the online feature store. So um, you kind of don't like share the same machines, same sh share the same resources between the features, the database, and all their services of the platform. Um, so yeah, you can decide how much how much storage you want to store into it, how many machines you want to replicate the data on, and how many MySQL nodes you want to have. Um, this is useful uh, when you're doing a lot of queries, so you can spread around the um, spread around the the load on the different MySQL uh, MySQL servers. Um, yeah. So that's that's pretty much it. Um, you can there are a bunch of other functionalities. Um, you can connect to uh, EKS uh, if you are on um, uh, AWS or 
uh, Azure uh, manage Kubernetes if you are on Azure to be able to uh, you do also model serving on the platform itself. Um, so once the cluster has been deployed, take a couple of minutes, um, then we can go through and create the projects and so on. So this is the, the, the new UI um, that we are developing and it's released. Um, so you can, you can try it out. Um, it's a feature source specific and you can see a bunch of information about all your feature groups that you have. Uh, I don't have any training data set right now. Um, you can connect and can create a bunch of uh, storage connectors. So storage connectors allow you to be able to interact with, uh, um, with different services. So um, if you have, um, if you have like a Snowflake database or a Redshift database, for instance, uh, or if you have data on S3, for instance, you can connect to them, configure all the authentication, authorization uh, policies and so on, and be able to yeah, pull data from, from there uh, into the feature store and so on. And uh, yeah, we you can use um, you can use Jupyter to um, to interact with the feature store uh, within Opsox, or you can use it from outside Opsox. So um, we have uh, users running from Databricks, uh, we have users running from EMR uh, or like Cloudera platforms if they are on prem. Um, so uh, it's it's quite flexible. The the only thing that you need essentially is the uh, is the uh, is the HSFS API. Um, they are available both in Python and Scala, so you can run them uh, on yeah on both PySpark and, and normal Spark essentially. Um, that's that's just an example of of, of the streaming uh, of a streaming ingestion. Uh, we have a bunch of data in a Kafka topic uh, that we uh, with transaction data. Um, so the idea here essentially is that we are plugging into this uh, Kafka topic, and we are um, essentially. Um, computing aggregations over different time windows and of the number of transactions that have been uh, that the user has been done and the amount has been done uh, and so on and so forth and we do that for different uh, time aggregations so we can do it in one hour we do it 12 hours and i think there's also uh, 10 minutes yes 10 minutes um so these are different uh, spark aggregations this is all spark streaming so there's nothing really specific uh, to the uh, feature store yet um, so the idea is essentially um, that this is where the feature store part comes into the picture. Um, we get a bunch of feature groups from the different uh, from feature store. So the different each each time aggregation is a different feature group, and we essentially insert the stream um, insert the, the stream data frame into the into the into the feature store. Um, yeah, this from from a, from my API perspective, this turns you back. Uh, uh, Spark streaming application essentially that you can check the status of it, see exactly, and monitor the status, and you can also decide at some point to 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 stop it. Um, where is that at the bottom? Essentially, you can yeah stop the applications. Um, another thing you can do is use the same streaming um, to uh, actually write to the offline feature store. Um, in that case, uh, instead of doing, we actually. Uh, don't provide a PI, but you can do it with uh, the four batch uh, method. Essentially, yeah, in Spark streaming, um, you can uh, call this four batch method. Takes a bunch of uh, data, gets into together, and and does the does the ingestion in the offline feature store. Uh, one last thing, then I think I'm, I'm out of time um, for the offline for the actually getting the data out of the feature store. Um, this works on, on a Python uh, on a Python level essentially. Uh, as I mentioned before, you get a training data set. So essentially, um, yeah, the aggregation of different feature groups. Uh, we can see which uh, primary keys we are expecting as an input. So in this case, it's only the credit card number that made the transaction. Um, so we can essentially uh, uh, get a bunch of credit card numbers and getting the, the 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 vector for each of the credit card number. Um, the idea is that like the first time you call this method, then all this metadata operation happens and fetch the metadata and so on. Um, all the rest of the met all the rest of the operation then use this cache metadata to um, to not affect uh, performance and so on. So that's uh, pretty much it, I would say. Uh, if you have any questions, then we can discuss later, but I think I, I'm actually out of time. So um, yeah. Go back to Thank you, Fabio. Uh, let's hand it over to Arbaz Khan, uh, who is a software engineer at DoorDash, 
who is going to tell us a little bit about how DoorDash is solving this problem and building an online feature store, a cost-efficient one on top of Redis. Uh, Arbas, please take it away. Thanks, Tabor. Let me share my screen. Um, hi, everyone. Excited to be a part of this uh, catalog of feature store talks. I believe it's a commendable initiative. Thanks to Jim, DeVore, Natalia, everyone else to keep the show running. And thanks all for joining. Uh, some of you might be up early. Some of you might be staying up late. And uh, some of you couldn't att attend this live. Um, I'm excited for all of you guys. Because I'm going to share a secret sauce behind DoorDash's feature store. There's a lot of content and concepts um, on the web around feature stores, but less often do we get to see the details around implementation. That's why I love the talk uh, Fabio gave right now around the uh, feature store API. And this is also what I plan to change with this talk uh, to give more details of the imp implementation and hopefully more uh, content from me in the future in that direction. So let's get started. Um, let's go back in time a bit. Um, machine learning platform team our DoorDash has quickly adopted multiple internal teams. Um, we are in the middle of pandemic. Uh, this is the food delivery industry is booming. And so we see a 100x growth from 15,000 predictions per second for our uh, model serving to uh, 1.5 million predictions per second. And this is all within uh, a span of three months. And as you would know, within the realm of platform development, it's uh, less time to react. So we are throwing money at the problem. We are rapidly and horizontally scaling our systems and our costs go up. We start to huddle together to see what are the alternatives. Uh, and at the same time, weekend after weekend, we are scaling our systems out. So it was time to focus on scaling up rather than scaling out. And there were many optimizations that we did on the microservice layer and the infrastructure layer. But what we're going to focus on today is what we did to the feature store. So we initially set out with a goal to cut our costs of operating the feature store and being comfortable if you know we have to compromise the performance to some extent. Uh, but actually, we exceeded our expectations and got better performance. In fact, when uh, the engineering org conducted a load test uh, across DoorDash in an anticipation of a a major event, we withstood low tests that stretched us, stretched us up to 5x of our regular traffic. So what, what did we do there? Uh, that's what I'm going to cover. Uh, but before I walk you through exactly what we did, let me set up some context and introduce DoorDash's feature store. First, I'll go through the workflow uh, for feature serving. Uh, then I'll extend a view into what the features look like, not from a data scientist perspective, but more from storage and serving point of view. And then finally, we will get to the meat of this presentation, extending details on the schema design and such. And I'll we'll wrap it up with a look into the future plan. So all the good and the bad ML that you see at DoorDash is powered by microservices. Uh, at the forefront of model serving is uh, Sybil, our prediction service. Right behind is a low latency key value store, uh, a feature store. And it's also a sync of all our feature pipelines. Majority of our feature pipelines are long running ETLs um, that do aggregations on historical data. And then partly some of these aggregations are also on streaming sources. Um, let's, just, let's zoom inside the feature store to get the details there. There are two types of data stores involved, a Snowflake Warehouse uh, for the, all the offline workflows and a Redis store deployed in cluster mode for uh, the online workflow. So the stores themselves are uh, just a detail there. They are sharded for isolation. So as you can imagine, some use cases are non-overlapping. They use data that can well be isolated. So we will have separate tables and a separate Redis cluster. Uh, and this sets us up for uh, like scaling further and further. For the offline workflows, the things that are involved are model training. So all the queries that people would do, um, employ several filters, transformations, um, they all go through uh, through the Snowflake API. 
uh, for feature discovery, where we're looking up all the available features, the distribution of the values of these features, uh, again, hit the Snowflake API. And then there are some of these experiments that our data scientists, machine learning engineers would do, where they will push some features ad hoc into uh, the production for experiments uh, so that they don't have to uh, productionize the feature pipelines before understanding the success of these experiments. And then the Redis data store is used just for model serving. We, we use Elastic Cache for managing our Redis clusters. It gives a lot of freedom around scaling uh, and custom configuration. But again, Redis used just for model serving and it engages bulk of our costs. So it makes us think that uh, what should we do to handle these cost concerns? Should we even swap out this uh, in-memory store with perhaps a disk-based store, which can offload all the data to disk and um, like avoid all the expensive hosting of data in memory? Yes, there will be some compromise when you move from an in-memory store to a disk-based store for performance, but we thought we'd be okay if we still met our end-to-end -end SLAs. So we did some pre preliminary comparisons with the available uh, key value store, the disk based ones to understand that what is the penalty that we would have to pay and what is the promising candidate out there. And um, there are these bunch of comparisons, we do, but to be fair to all these uh, disk based stores, the kind of operations that we're doing here for online uh, model serving involves a bunch of batch random uh, lookups, which is probably best served in memory. Uh, when you do these like random seeks and disks, they, they will be expensive. But here we see a promising candidate um, shine. Uh, we see that the P99 latencies are almost single digit. And so we are excited, our eyes gleam in excitement. And so we see how much can we potentially Safe here if we were to replace Redis with uh, with with a candidate uh, from one of these risk-based key value stores. Um, but wait, what about CPU usage? Remember when I started, I was talking about predictions per second. So when you're talking about predictions per second, you're alluding towards number of lookups per second, and hence the CPU usage is important. Um, so we set up some benchmarks for comparison that how much CPU will we will we be using and understand. The, the 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 whole profile of CPUs. Uh, so we ended up discovering that if we were to employ the, the fastest uh, this base key value store, which will save us uh, on memory, uh, but we would end up spending on CPUs. We'll keep adding nodes uh, one after the other to us to so as to meet the high throughput requirement, and it in fact will overshoot uh, even our current costs. So this this was uh, kind of a a stepping stone towards looking inside Redis uh, and seeing that yes, Redis right now is the fastest and the cheapest store that we've got. So can we optimize Redis? Uh, that was uh, the, the step that we were at. And we were looking to optimize not just memory, but CPU as well. And uh, the, the goal was to make Redis do less work in each request and store the data that it requires efficiently. And to handle these challenge, this challenging problem, there is a need to understand what is going inside Redis, that is the features. So that's what we're going to do next, that we're going to jump in into the features and understand what these features look like. These features are the units of storage and lookup in the feature store, and hence understanding them can help ex, uh, expand the, the efficiency gains that you could get. So at DoorDash, features are divided into four types. The first one, numerical, it's a combination of integers and float values. And these are as simple as it gets. Um, for example, consider the number of deliveries made by a restaurant in the past week, integer, or uh, what is the delivery fee that is paid by the customer in a session. Um, and then second comes categorical features, which take a limited and fixed number of values. Uh, for instance, what was the medium that the customer used when placing an order? Uh, it can only take a limited set of values. And then comes the complex types, uh, which Fabio also talked about embeddings, the vector embeddings. 
they're using multiple different use cases, uh, customer em embeddings uh, for store rec uh, restaurant recommendations. Um, these look like uh, dense uh, lists of float values. Uh, for, uh, just for the purpose of storage, that's how we'll see them. Uh, and then one other type of feature that we use, uh, not native to open source modeling frameworks out there, but something that fits within DoorDash's ecosystem where we do some on the fly feature pre-processing. These are lists where we store things like in the past 10 days, what are these popular items that a restaurant served and try to match it with a customer's liking. Um, yeah, so this was a division of features on feature type. And then you can think of them as also a division uh, based on how they are oriented towards. They can be oriented towards an entity, a restaurant, a customer in this case, or towards a session where, uh, for example, the delivery fee here, which depends on a session there. Um, and so these are the two kind of uh, divisions that you can see features as. Um, and for for a feature store, uh, we would only consider the entity-based features. The session-based features come in within a prediction request. They are passed with the request as they keep changing with each session. But it's only the entity-based features that uh, land up in the feature store. So given that now we know how each feature is different from another, uh, the question is, can we exploit it to uh, curate our specialized uh, storage scheme? And this is where we get to the meat of the presentation. So get ready to put some oxygen masks because we are going to go real deep. Um, so yeah, our goal is to, again, reduce uh, CPU and memory that uh, Redis employs. So when Redis will do less work in each lookup operation, that's when CPU consumed will drop down. And when data is compactly represented without any loss of information, memory will meaningfully drop down, right? So what, one thing that to realize here is that in each request, there are more features than there are entities, right? For example, if you're doing uh, a restaurant recommendation, there are a bunch and bunch of features involved there, but there are only two entities, the restaurant and the customer. Um, so what does this have, uh, allude towards that? What if we were to restructure our lookups from feature to entities? So we're not doing feature lookups, but we're doing entity feature lookups. And that's where Redis will uh, give you this nice uh, abstraction in the form of Redis hashes. What Redis hashes do is that you're not just storing a key value pair, you can store a top level key and embed hash keys and hash values within that top level key, which perfectly fits our case because we'll make the entities as the top level key and the feature name and the values as the embedded hash key hash values so that all the features for entity live within the same hash key. Uh, the benefit here is that you are making all the data for an entity live on the same node of a Redis cluster. Again, Redis clusters, they will have multiple nodes and the data will be distributed on those nodes it will be best if all the data that we need for an entity is on the same node. And there's one other thing that happens here is that when you're doing lookups, you're not sending multiple Redis instructions. You're sending one single Redis uh, instruction in this case, just to be uh, specific with the Redis API, it is an HM get command, which is like a hash multiple get, I believe. Uh, if you were to instead store them as feature name and value pairs, you will do multiple get commands. Um, but with this, you are restricting the number of CPU, uh, reducing the number of instructions sent to Redis, which in turn reduces the uh, CPU that Redis will uh, employ because it has to process less instructions, although it's doing more work per operation, but uh, there's this optimization per request that they can do the batch optimizations here. And, and there's the one last thing that, that Redis hashes also, um, provide to you as, as a gain, which is that these hash tables, they are more efficiently stored in memory than just top level key value pairs. Um, these, they, they, they do not store these top level key metadata within the hash keys. So in Redis, you can store all the key metadata, uh, the things that people use often, the time to live, um, those kind of things are not available in the hash key, uh, hash key. So that does end up saving space. So if, 
you do not need them, then you can exploit uh, this kind of offering. And at the same time, there is uh, this like internal uh, configurations that you can do within Redis to even further optimize how that hash table is stored. Um, because like the implementation of hash tables can be different and each implementation has uh, this memory performance trade-off. So for small hash tables, you can make a good memory trade-off, which Redis, by the way, does provide you out of the box. So this was all about like reorienting features from fe uh, like a feature level to an entity level. Now, what if we uh, were to use what is the type information within these features? We just recently uh, uh, went through all these different kind of features and we learned that how they're different from each other. Um, now, now, can we exploit this to make more curated storage for these different types? The first one, a lot of you might have seen it coming. The categorical features, they are storing a mapping of sorts, which the model does not care. Uh, it does not need the string phone. It will, it will obviously do some kind of uh, mapping internally where it will convert the strings to integers if you supply them to the model. So why not just store them as enums uh, to begin with? And then second, something that Fabi also covered that uh, these embeddings are best if they're encoded in the binary form uh, rather than a string form. Because like if you were to see these dense float lists, if you were to store them as string, which is uh, by uh, design for Redis, the default, the storage format, um, the string format. So if you were to store them as binary, you're, you're storing much less data per embedding. Uh, so protocol buffer is one convenient option. I see Fabio is using Avro. Uh, we use protocol buffers. Um, and then lists, they can also uh, benefit from the same uh, approach of using the binary form of storage rather than the string form. But there's one other thing that you can do on lists, uh, which is you can exploit the redundancy in values. Uh, and when we talk about redundancy, compression is what comes into mind. That's what we did. We're doing compression before we are converting them into their protocol buffer format. Now you will ask me that why do compression on lists but not on embeddings, right? So there's this detail around these embeddings uh, that these, since they are these uh, dense float values, they do not benefit a lot from compression. Uh, there are multiple alternative approaches that people uh, take which end up and reducing the size of these embeddings, but that does not come without incurring uh, uh, a loss in model performance. So these are like other functional changes people do to reduce the size of embeddings, but compression, uh, if you were to even like try it, it won't give you any gains. And uh, it will like, in fact, uh, make it slower to look up embeddings because you're doing that decompression and compression uh, uh, on, on the fly. Um, and then one interesting um, uh, thing that we did to the numerical features, uh, going by what we did to embeddings and lists, we were saying that these floats and teasers are best stored in the binary form, but these numerical features, when we stored them in the binary form, they ended up consuming more space than if they were stored as in comparison to if they were stored as strings. This is uh, again, like something to ponder at that. Why would this be the case? Why would a binary form for an or set of integers be more uh, expensive in memory uh, than strings? So the reason why this was the case was because all these features that we were using, they were sparse features and they had a lot more zero values. Uh, so we just like imagine zeros there stored as strings so to store a single digit zero in a string. It's a single byte, but if you're storing all your numerical features as float, eight byte floats, then you are uh, not going with that optimized storage. Like that, that's just like something very specific to the nature of distribution that we had. And it's not that everybody can employ it obviously, but you have to understand the distribution of these features that what will benefit you more in terms of like storing them. Uh, for us, it was strings. Um, we and we discovered it after like understanding um, trying out these different things um, and so it's important to understand the nature of your own data to see which ones uh, of these serializations will be applicable to you and then just one last thing that uh, 
a lot of these uh, feature store implementations tend to ignore is that they use feature names as is throughout uh, the ecosystem. And it is perhaps uh, done so for the sake of uh, convenience that if you're using a feature name, uh, you're passing that feature name to the data scientist, you're passing it to the application or to the platform team, and it be it's best to refer them by names. So something like a number of deliveries, uh, you can just like, when, it, when communicating requirements, um, you, you call out these names, but the feature store does not like it. It wants more efficiency in storage. Uh, so it does not care about this feature name for storage. And there's one thing that you can see here that this feature name that we're seeing, it's 38 bytes a string. If these strings were to be converted to a hash, they will just be a four bytes. So you're doing the string hashing to a 32 bit integer, or just four bytes as hash. Um, yeah, uh, and then there's this question to ask that why not do like a enum mapping here as well? Why not like convert your feature names to uh, enum mapping and then store these mappings? But uh, it's a little more complicated because you are doing all these things across multiple different systems. So there's an offline feature store, there's online feature store, and then there's a lot of these notebook experiments that you're doing. You have to keep these mappings in sync which won't be ideal because like you keep adding features um, and uh, there's, there's, a, there's quickly a chance that you could go out of sync there, but hashes will be deterministic. If you use a non-cryptographic hash function, it can even be faster for uh, hashing uh, and, and uh, it can obviously save you all that space that you're wasting otherwise. So a lot of things here, I want to sum it up uh, and see that all this effort that you're doing, what are the gains that you're getting? And this is, these are the numbers that we have straight from the production after migrating one of our feature store shards. So CPU usage dropped by about three X, the memory improvements were also in a similar range. Um, so whether this effort, all these efforts will pay off for you or not, it will depend on how much is three X for you in absolute numbers. Uh, it was a big gain to us and we ended up rolling it out to all our use cases. Uh, so if you were to ask me, what are the key takeaways? There's a lot of things here. So the first one, when there's high throughput requirement at low latency uh, and CPU is the bottleneck and in-memory uh, store, online feature store is the go-to option. Redis worked for us. It could be any other in-memory store for you, but it has to be an in-memory store, we believe. Second, uh, that if you do stick with Redis as your in-memory store, there's one optimization ready for you to employ which is the Redis hashes, and this will further reduce your cost of operation. And third, finally, if you were willing to go to the extra mile to save cost, there's more gains you can get by understanding your data and seeing how to serialize these uh, features that you're storing. Um, yeah, there's, there was a lot of these details that are covered. A lot of these are documented with further details on how you can set up your own benchmark playground for experiments. In this uh, blog, some of you might have already read it, I believe, uh, but others who haven't, I encourage reading it out if you uh, enjoyed uh, this all discussion. And uh, in terms of future work, what else can you expect from us in this domain? Uh, we are thinking of feature storage can be further condensed. Um, and uh, we think that there is a chance, there, there are these use cases which are uh, bottlenecked on memory rather than on CPU. So we are, uh, experiment on whether we can have a multi-level cache design where not all features are put online. And with that, I'll uh, end it right here. I know I'm just at time. Uh, I'll uh, hand it over to Devor. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, being with me on this. Thank you, Arbaz. Great talk, deep talk. Thank you very much for, uh, for doing this today. Uh, Jim will take over and moderate the questions. I think we have a large number of questions, both right. in chat and Q&A. So, and he has been great in answering them live. So Jim kind of take it away. Yeah, th thanks. Uh, thanks a million, Arbaz. Thanks, Fabio. Two fantastic talks on um, a really hot area, you know, to how to operationalize your models and, and uh, give them a brain a working memory that they can actually build big feature vectors out of. There were a lot of questions and um, I'll start with Arbaz because a lot of the Fabio ones were answered um, in, in time. So the first one is from Mark Roy. What size payload was being used in your latency chart? That should be a quick one. 
Um, yeah, that's a good one. So we do batch our lookups and there are like thousand features that we look up in a single request. Uh, these tend to be in, I'll say, uh, tens of kilobytes to hundreds of kilobytes, depending on the use case. Okay, and uh, the obvious one, are you gonna release this as open source? Um, yeah, this is something I'm pushing towards. So DoorDash, uh, I believe does not have an open source repository yet. And this is what we want to change. And uh, if there's if there's interest, yes, it will definitely come out. I want to move our, country, uh, our team at least in that direction. Um, there was a question from Jerry. How long did the migration work take? I guess he means all the changes you made to uh to Redis to compress the data? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. So again, uh, all these uh, experiments do form a bulk of the work. The migration itself is a little bit uh, easier in comparison because you're doing that behind uh, in the storage API layer. So the users don't have to be uh, caring of like how you're doing the feature lookups or storage. It's all within uh, this whole ecosystem maintained by the machine learning platform team. Uh, the migration, there were, there were some cases where we had to do some AB testing to make sure that uh, these form format changes do not uh, interfere with our conversions. Um, and so, yeah, it did, took, it did take us for like about two to three months to do the migration once we had the results. Great. Um, the there's a question about the TTL and feature values since you changed to hash values. I, I, I add something on that. How do you search them? Like if I want to prefix search or on, if you've hashed the feature names. So yeah, the TTL and feature values since you've hashed the feature names and then how do you search them? Does that the effect of hashing the feature names, has that negatively affected some functionality? Um, in terms of lookups, no. Uh, like the only, a thing that we saw were benefits in terms of like how much storage we got. At TTLs, we did not care about TTLs uh, for the features themselves. Uh, we would do forceful evictions if there's a need, um, but yeah. Are, are you using this for NLP or any image stuff for just tabular data? It is a plan for this quarter, not yeah. yet. Yeah. And do you actually use embeddings? Yes, we use embeddings. Uh, and do you need GPUs for some of those for the inference models? Uh, not yet. Uh, we use PyTorch uh, for our embeddings, um, models that use embeddings, but they don't use uh, GPUs yet, only CPUs. Yeah. Do you have some features in, in Snowflake, but not in Redis? Uh, okay, interesting one again. Yeah, there are some features, but maybe the ones that are in experimental mode where people are just trying to understand the distributions. Uh, yeah, and there's a chance for that. Uh, uh, lack of sync between the online and offline feature store. Um, yeah. Here's a good, here's a good follow on question. How do you then compute the features? What, what tools are you using? What frameworks? And how often do you do it? Like, are you doing streaming or batch or? Yeah, to compute the features, uh, some use cases use Spark and all the, all, uh, the data goes into Snowflake. We also use the Snowflake's inbuilt SQL constructs, which have some kind of abstraction over SQL. Um, so those come in handy as well, uh, but yeah, no Spark streaming. Yeah, and here, I mean, this is an interesting one, like, because Redis doesn't have any asset guarantees. What if you get failures and in terms of insertions and, and things like that? Um, yeah, so if you get failures- Also high availability, you know, I mean, I know that, um, you know, if, I don't know if you follow Jepson, but they had some very harsh things to say about Redis. Yeah, um, yeah, Elasticash. Uh, does uh, manage some of these failovers for us. So these, if these nodes go down, they do end up uh, incurring these uh, like costs of missing out feature lookups and increasing the latency in the process. Uh, but in practice, it's rare we see them maybe like once a month or so uh, in terms of like uh, losses while insertion that is taken care of by our uh, workflows uh, that uh, they try to make sure that the data is inserted and the number of features match. Uh, in this online and the offline ones for, for the use cases that matter. Right. And I think the last one for DoorDash, and I'll vote to Fabio. Um, the, it said, which improvements gave the most CPU, or which, which changes made the most CPU improvements? And then you change from per feature lookup to en entity lookups. How big a, an improvement did that give? Yes, yes, that, that was it. And the Redis hashes uh, is what gave the most CPU improvement. There's a, a breakdown in the blog in, in how much each one of these different approaches uh, contributed in CPU, in memory. Uh, but yeah, for CPU, Redis hashes is what um, 
And but for the for the going from per feature to per entity lookup, what kind of a contribution do that have? I know there's some feature stores who look at just per feature, but you've gone over to an entity one, which is kind of like Hopsworks, I guess. Mm -hmm. What kind of a, a change did that make for you? So yeah, that is uh, very synonymous with uh, hashes. Like that's the reason why we chose Redis hashes so that we can employ these entity based lookups. Uh, so yeah, uh, I mean that's the exclusive reason why we chose put the Redis hashes for uh, apart from like the memory gains that come with Redis hashes. So yeah, I'll say the gains uh, were, that's how we summed up the gains that Redis hashes and entity-based lookups would mean the same thing for us. Okay, great. A lot of questions there. We're getting a lot of questions. Great. Yeah, it's anonymous, yeah, but that's fine. Uh, Fabio, um, for Hopsworks, would you elaborate on, on um, how using Kafka as this intermediate step, how does that improve availability of the online feature store? Yeah, well, I mean, you, putting Kafka in the middle, you are basically decoupling, producing feature data and consuming feature data. So the user can uh, write as much as they want, as long as the Kafka uh, can sustain. Kafka has like nice also back of capabilities to basically push back if the consumer is actually, if a producer is actually writing too, 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 too fast. Uh, of course, you can tune like number of uh, partitions and so on so that you can uh, increase throughput if you have to. But the main one is basically essentially the consumer dictates uh, how fast we're going to write into the uh, into the uh, online feature store. Uh, as platform, we have control over the consumer side, but we don't have control over the producer side. Um, so in that stage, we um, yeah we, we basically are we basically controlling that side essentially. Well, I, I guess that's because Hopsworks is a kind of an open platform where someone could run a huge job in Databricks and write to it. And, and DoorDash, do you have that or? Arbaz, do you have any issues related to that that you have to, because obviously you can overload, you know, if you overload Redis, you'll, you'll overload it, but how do you handle that? Is it through, you know, testing your workloads or is it? Um... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, sorry, I, I missed that last part again. Uh, well, I mean, if you, all right, you know, if you run, run a large batch application to write to Redis, you can potentially overload Redis. What, what, what kind of mechanism do you have in place to, around that, is it mostly benchmarking or managing your workloads or do you have actual additional mm -hmm. uh, protections? Um, so in fact, for us, the Snowflake throughput ends up being the throttling factor. So we are querying Snowflake and feeding it to Redis. It doesn't happen that we are dumping a whole lot of data that can overwhelm Redis. So uh, we have been saved uh, in that regard, but yeah, that's a good interesting case to consider that how can we avoid, put some guardrails yeah. there. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we, I think we had some of these were answered. There was one about uh, what language was written in. I say, well, go Google, sorry. Uh, <laughs> the, um, yeah, there's one question about Topsworks uh, from uh, Ezwar at Prasa. Is it one consumer group or multiple consumer groups for the topics in Kafka? Well, I guess this is when you're materializing. It's like, uh, well, I mean, it's, it's it, we have one consumer group uh, per, yeah, we have one consumer group and then we can have multiple instances coming from the, uh, this is only to write to the online feature store. So you have one consumer group and then you have multiple consumers within the same consumer group. Um, if you have multiple instances of the, of the, of the same, uh, of the online feature store service. Um, so in that case, basically pulling, like it's gonna be responsible for one partition, it's gonna be pulled partially part of the data. If you're also writing from the same Kafka topic to the offline feature store, then uh, you would have to have another consumer group there. So otherwise you end up writing half to the online feature store and half to the, uh, offline feature store. Arpas is, is multitasking, which is great. I see you're writing an answer. Do you want to say your answer? The question is, how do you monitor data quality in on features stored in, in Redis? Yeah, I was, I was just answering that. So yeah, all our feature quality monitoring workflows go on Snowflake. Uh, Redis is meant to mimic Snowflake as much as possible for the internet use cases. So we try to understand all these value distributions, uh, see all the feature drifts and such. And then finally for model serving, we also log the features that were used in prediction. So that way we can track that how many times did we miss out on feature lookups. Um, so that gives like, like some uh, hint into feature uh, quality monitoring as well. Have you, have you heard of evaluation store yet, Arbaz? Uh, uh, yeah, we, we call that as the prediction store. Didn't know that that was the term to use, but yeah, that will use that. It's a new key buzzword that, that, yeah. that pushed out there, you know? So um, I guess we'll hear more about it here on this channel uh, coming soon. Uh, uh, I have a question for you um, about um, 
you know, you mentioned you have to find the right Redis server. So obviously you're sharding requests across. So you, you have a big farm, so you don't mm -hmm. have one Redis. Uh, we then need to know where to go, but that needing to know where to go for a particular feature or entity ID, typically that itself needs to be HA and it needs to be a service. So how are you managing that? Yeah, so the isolation has been uh, like end to end. So the microservice itself that is uh, put to use for some of these high volume use cases will uh, contain all these uh, environment variables, which will prefix which feature store to use. There's no like one too many mapping between microservices and feature store. So when uh, the one of the internal microservices hit these intended microservices, it will go to the right feature store. Uh, but yeah, we are seeing down the line that there will be a case for us to support that one too many architecture. And for that, uh, yes, there is a config service uh, plan and there will be a consideration of how much QPS and availability uh, can, can we guarantee there. And uh, that's where things will get interesting. It hasn't happened so far because each one of these uh, individual shards have been uh, like able to support the throughput requirements, which were again, huge and millions of QPS. But once you take it level further, I believe you would have to do that split within a single microservice for two multiple feature stores. This sounds very much like consistent hashing and, and, and rebuilding Dynamo. Is that kind of in the plan? I mean, you know, there's, there's consistent hashing rings that, that are designed to handle this and to balance load across, you know, where you, where you have a range of, of key value pairs that, that become hot and things like that. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, DynamoDB is something that we didn't consider. I guess there might be some uh, performance trade-offs that we would have to make uh, if we do go with that design or if we employ a third uh, party uh, vendor there. Uh, but Actually, yeah. there's, I, I, will, I will plug uh, Mikkel Ronstrom, who, who's the inventor of RonDB, who works at Logic Clocks. He, he wrote a really interesting blog about there's a new way of handling hot, uh, if you've got a, a really hot partition where a lot of keys are being accessed, typically we split them, we shard them. But he, he actually talked about how in RonDB we can increase the number of read-only threads. So if your workload is very read-intensive, you can actually add read-only threads to handle the, the hot partitions. It's a kind of a, a new novel way I've seen it handling, which is very cool. Uh, yeah. We have another question here. Let's see. Where in this architecture is the place to monitor data quality? Oh, we had this already. Yeah, sorry, Diana, that was answered. Um, yeah, great. I think we're kind of, we're over time. We've, we've had so many questions tonight. It's been fantastic. Um, Thank you, everyone. Thanks. All, all the, particularly thank you, the community, for all of the interest and, and, and questions. And of course, thanks to Fabio and Arbaz and then and Natalia and Davor and um, everyone tonight. And uh, I see every, most people stay to the end. Everyone's still here. I know we're over time and many of it's your work day um, and we're stealing from it. And uh, thank you to your bosses for contributing to that uh, 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 as well. So we'll be back again. I think it's at May 4th, Natalia, or? Yes, May 4th, we're we'll back with um, Spotify. And just a little reminder to, if you want to receive the recording, sign up to receive the, for the newsletter at futurestore.org. Uh, then we can, you can have access to early version of the recording next week. <laughs> yeah, we, we had a little thing about a lot of questions came in to only the panelists and comments. And Brandon Sagel wrote, phenomenal job. Very interesting projects. Thanks very much for that. Everyone else hasn't seen it, by the way, Brandon, and it just came to the panelists. But um, we, that's a Zoom issue. It wasn't our issue. Um, but um, hopefully we'll try and fix that somehow next time. Well, thank you all so much. Amazing presentation. Great questions tonight. And we'll see you all on May 4th again. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.